Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is Andrea Valeria. She's a remote work specialist who helps people get their very first remote job. She's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Business Insider, Forbes, and Condé Nast Traveler, just to name a few publications. Andrea, how's it going? Hi there. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Yes, I, I've always loved your resources and all your content on Twitter. So it's excited, exciting to now be part of the podcast too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And where are you calling in from today? So right now I am in Mexico City, which is, I guess we'll get into it a little bit more later, but it's one of my favorite cities in Latin America. So this is where I live now after traveling around for a while, mostly in Latin America and deciding like, okay, this is where I'm going to stay. <laughs> awesome. And you're very Panamania, Panamanissima, I think, because uh, when I read your bio, uh, your about me on your website, it said, I could live off patacones. <laughs> yes, I like right now I am planning a trip to Panama City like for five days. I just want to go and eat like everything that I can't get anywhere else. Like pan, like patacones, sancocho. I want to get some dim sum. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been to Panama City, you know, Panamanians are obsessed with dim sum. So I, yeah, I need to go and just make a food trip to Panama City. <laughs> So let's uh, kind of warm up on the episode and just talk about food because I think that'll get you flowing. So tell us a bit about uh, Panamanian food. Like for people who aren't aware, what are patacones? So patacones are plantains that are fried, like totally deep fried. Uh, you can also make them on the air fryer if you're trying to go healthier. <laughs> but those are so good. It's basically like what Panamanians use instead of French fries. And I grew up on patacones. I love them. And I can't get them that easily here in Mexico. And even if I get them, it, it, I don't know how to make them, to be totally honest. <laughs> um, so, yes, patacones are awesome. And you should try them. Well, I know you probably have tried them, but other people should try them. I definitely have tried them. Um, I haven't been to Panama in uh, a while now. I'm actually scheduled to go in a couple months. And so maybe you can help refresh me. Sancocho, I love. I think maybe maybe uh, listeners who have been to Colombia are probably yeah. familiar with Sancocho, which is like a chicken soup, right? Right. So I, I, I would say that a lot of Latin countries have Sancocho, but it's not the same in every country. So, for example, Colombia has Sancocho, one based out of beef, and then one's a chicken Sancocho. In Panama, it's just chicken Sancocho. And um, the Sancocho has a bunch of, like, potato type things, but not potato. Um, like, how do you call them? Like yuca and otoe, ñame, no idea how to say those in English. Um, but those are things I can't get over here in Mexico either. So yeah, it's a, it's a good hearty soup that grandma used to give you when you were sick. <laughs> and, and what's the piece of uh, fried bread called? Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? It's like a breakfast food. It's well, like is it a fried uh, corn. No, it's like a piece of fried dough. It's like... Oh, Ojalá. Oh, yeah, say that again? Yes, yes, fried dough. <laughs> yes. I, I always thought that one was funny. That's a staple. And I mean, I love Panamanian food because I am Panamanian. But if I am going to be 100% honest, I do not think it's like the best gastronomy in the world. It certainly is not the best one in Latin America, in my opinion. To, like I'm trying to not be biased, but I am, so I love it. But if you go to Panama, just expect a lot of fried things, which are fun and everything, but maybe not sustainable to eat every day. <laughs> and I didn't know about the dim sum. Like I, kn I know that there's um, a bit of a culture of going to Chinese buffets for lunch in, in Panama. Could you expand on that a bit? Yeah, so Panama has a lot, um, had a lot of, Chinese immigration. Well, you might know that right around the um, times of when we were building the Panama Canal, I say we like I was there, but when Panama was building the Panama Canal, we had a lot of immigration from different places of people who participated in the construction of the canal. And right around that time, a lot of Chinese people moved to Panama and started establishing like commerces, stores, 
in Panama, there are like all the um, little convenience stores are usually owned by Chinese people. That's something you might have noticed. And uh, whenever like they, they brought their culture and they brought their food, there are a lot of uh, Chinese restaurants and Panamanians especially love dim sum. So like Chinese breakfast with all the dumplings. And there's a re really famous restaurant that if you go to Panama, you must go called Lung Fung. Um, and my, my, gra my, like the, my grandma is actually Chinese. <laughs> so I have a little bit more of like this Chinese influence in my family. Uh, but yeah, Panamanians love dim sum. It's actually like a tradition every Sunday for like whole families to go to either Lung Fung, there's another one called Golden Unicorn. And I heard that nowadays they even have like vegan versions of dim sum because some people love it so much, but they're vegan. So yeah, you should definitely go to dim sum if you go to Panama. <laughs> That's funny. I have a pin on my map for uh, Lung Fung, but I've never been. Oh, it's a must. Oh my gosh. It's really cool. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now I, uh, I have something on my to-do list when, when I go there. Absolutely. And you have to go like every day until like 1 p.m. They serve dim sum and they drive like they have little carts and they go around the tables and give you all the food from the carts. So it kind of feels like authentic and cool. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, maybe, Andrea, you could tell us a little bit more about your story. So you grew up in Panama and then you moved to Florida for college. And then uh, my understanding is you worked as like a TV news reporter for a time. Yes. Actually, the very first stop was St. Louis, Missouri. So I got a scholarship to go to a university there, Lindenwood University. And uh, I ended up in the Midwest. So I moved to Missouri and I was there for four years for my undergrad. Then I uh, went to Miami for a little bit. Then I moved to Orlando, Florida. I went to Full Sail University for an entertainment business master's degree. And... Then, oh, no, sorry, before the master's degree, I, w I also lived in Tampa, Florida. Uh, my dream, like since I was a little girl, was to be in front of cameras, talk. So like being a TV news reporter sounded like a really good idea uh, most of my life. And my very first job out of college was actually as a TV news reporter in Tampa. And whenever you're a TV news reporter, if you are new, you are not going to get to pick like your assignments and do like the cool feature stories that you would imagine and all that you get like crime and someone got murdered on third street andrea go cover that so i was covering a lot of crime and st petersburg has a really where where my, my the station was located in st petersburg florida so that place actually has a really high crime rate so i would cover a lot of crime murders and horrible things every day and I was like, okay, this is super depressing. I maybe was wrong about this whole being a TV news reporter thing. I also had to wear pantsuits every day, heels. Um, and then when you are a new TV news reporter, you actually, well, in this particular station, you don't get a cameraman and you don't get someone to drive your, your station van. You have to do everything yourself. So you have to shoot, edit, carry all your stuff, drive the van, uh, be in front of being on camera, then edit everything. So it was, I mean, I learned a lot. Yes, but it was exhausting. And I was like, I don't, I'm not sure I want to be doing this for a long time. So I only did it for like a year. Okay, cool. And then starting to work remote in 2015. Uh, that's extremely impressive. That's quite early on. How did that come about? Yes. Um, so I, well, after Florida, I lived in Hawaii for two years. So I got a very corporate job in like hospitality and I was running the photography of different hotels. So I got to be like the director of operations of this company in Hawaii. And it was like, you know, like fancy title. It was like a good job, you would say, um, but it was super corporate and I would, I had zero work-life balance. It was just very intense. So I was not enjoying that. And then one day I learned, I, I, I read a book by the owner of the Huffington Post, Ariana Huffington. Uh, I think the book, book is called Thrive. 
So I read it like in 2014 or something. And this book was all about the, when she realized that she had no work-life balance. So she was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing with my life? I work so many hours a week. At some point she had like some sort of like um, medical emergency and the doctors told her like, it's because you're working too much. And I was like, oh my God, that's going to happen to me. <laughs> like my life is going to end because I just work and I have no life outside of work. I have no hub hobbies, anything. So I started working uh, in, well, I was working in this company and I was running a lot of different branches of the company from one branch. So most of the communication that I was having with the employees and with um, like the other, co my coworkers was online, like we were using Skype back then. <laughs> and um, it was just a lot of like online work and communication, collaboration. So I went out to my bosses and I was like, hey, I think I can actually do everything I'm doing from home. And they were like, absolutely not. <laughs> you have to be at one, uh, at our, one of our offices and that's how it's going to be. And I was like, um, how about I do two days a week from home? They, was, they were like, no. So I kept insisting because I am like that intense <laughs> until they finally accepted like for me to work from home two days a week. And that was all that was already like a big relief for me because I don't I didn't have to commute. My commute was like 40 minutes each way. So that was a lot and for me at that, at that point. Right. So eventually I convinced them and I was working from home two days a week. And we had like this three months of doing that. And then I was like, hey, how about I work from home every day? And they were like, well, actually, you proved that it's kind of working. You're actually kind of more productive. I was happier. And they accepted that. So after doing that for like three more months, I was like, okay, how about I continue to do what I'm doing right now, but while traveling? And again, no one was really doing I mean, it was not popular back then to be a remote worker or to work while traveling. This was 2014, I think, when I first brought it up. So they were they were like, absolutely, no, you need to be here. You're the director of operations. So I basically gave them all the ways in which I would actually be more productive, happier. They would save money. They, you know, so I gave them like all the benefits that were in there in, in this idea for them. And they started thinking about it. And eventually they were like, OK, you can work while traveling. <laughs> so. I don't know. I just, I felt like my life was uh, very boring and I didn't like the routine. And I read this book and I was like, you know, it's time for a change. And I just talked to them about it and they finally accepted. So yay. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. It makes me think about the phrase, like you don't get what you don't ask for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like o Oprah says, you only, you get, you get what you have the courage to ask for something like that. So absolutely, I, I truly believe that. Mm -hmm. Or you get what you negotiate. Also, yeah. <laughs> and I, I imagine um, your remote work career has taken a couple turns or iterations since 2015. And um, you've probably learned a lot along the way, potentially even changed careers. Yes, absolutely. So I've had like 700 different types of things that I've done since I started. So I started working with the same company that I was working for in Hawaii as a full-time remote job. This job was in HR. So I was like hiring and recruiting candidates mostly remotely. Well, no, completely remotely. And that's what I started doing. So for the first year of my remote work life, I did that. But while I was doing that, I was like, I have all this free time. So, okay, let me start having some freelance, doing some freelance gigs. Um, that's around when I started. It's a travel OD too, which is the platform that I have now. And at the beginning, it was just me documenting like this is where I'm traveling to. I, I like, as long as I have Wi-Fi, I can work and this is awesome. <laughs> and people were like, what, how is that happening? You know, it was not common back then. So eventually, um, as I started growing my platform and I started getting more freelance gigs, I went up to my bosses and I was like, okay, now how about I switch to part-time because I'm a big believer in like just moving slow and not like taking it step by step. So I didn't want to leave the full-time remote job, even if it's not 
really what I truly loved and wanted to do because, I mean, it was still a steady income. And if you're traveling, you don't want to just lose your steady income and then, you know, be at the mercy of freelance gigs or whatever. And I was just starting. So it was not like it was super steady back then. So then I switched to part-time with them and I did freelance and I continued to build my platform. I did that for like a year, two years. Then I also started like learning about passive income. I published uh, books on Amazon. I also started doing like affiliate marketing. So finally, I, uh, and I was still documenting everything on social media. So people continue to ask like, okay, how do I do this? How do I get a remote job? So the first idea that I had was, okay, let me start a remote job directory because I know all these companies and I have all these friends that are also working remotely uh, or are hiring. So I can just, you know, have a remote job directory so people can find remote jobs. So that was in 2019 when I published my uh, remote job directory. But then people were like, okay, cool. You are giving me the jobs, but how do I get them? <laughs> so I was like, all right, let me help you with that. Since I had this HR background, I started making resumes for my for my followers or for people. I mean, it was a service that I was charging for, of course. So uh -huh. this was the Remotify Your Resume service. Started in 2019. And then people were like, awesome, but now I need more. I need to know exactly how to find the... Right. What to say in the interview, how to find the jobs, um... how to apply, how to, how to know if it's an online scam, how do I identify my skills? How do I know if I'm cut out for the remote work environment or not? You know, so I started doing online workshops also in 2019. But the online workshops that I was doing were live and they were like two hours. It was not enough time for me to cover everything that I wanted to cover. So eventually I was like, okay. I need to do a full course on how to help people, you know, on how helping people on how to land their, their first remote job. So actually the course is called land your first remote job. And I published it in the beginning of 2020 and then the pandemic hit. So now people, because before the pandemic, people had always come to me like, Hey, what you're doing looks cool. Uh, I would love also to like travel and have that flexibility and it just looks glamorous and cool. <laughs> but then after the pandemic, it was like, okay, now I need to work remotely. I need to make money working from home. So help me. So it was really good timing that I had been doing it for such a long time and talking about this and uh, releasing this course right around when people needed it. So, yeah. Yeah. Are those, uh, are those books that you wrote still on Amazon or did you sunset that? No, I still have them on there. It's there two books because at the beginning when I was um, like talking a lot about when I was uh, talking about all my journey of working remotely, I was doing it a lot on YouTube and making vlogs. I was also doing a lot of Facebook video back then. <laughs> um, so it was a lot of since I have the video background from being a TV news reporter, being on camera and also like editing. I was like, okay, I'm going to make blogs. So I was doing a lot of blogs. So my first book is actually called So You Want to Blog, and it's still up there. <laughs> and then the second one is about how to get books on Amazon. <laughs> there you go. No, yeah. but, it, it, you know, you took a, a skill set that you had and you uh, you monetized it and by by teaching other people how to do it. Yes, that, that I think that's something that I've learned along the way. If you listen to what people are asking you, you can literally just create resources to help them with that exact thing. So people are asking me about how to find remote jobs. Here you go, you have a remote job directory now. How do I make my resumes? I'm gonna offer you the service. How do I get the jobs? Let me make this course and sell it to you to help you exactly with that. So yeah, I think that's something I've learned along the way, how you can literally just listen to your audience and, and see what they need. Not necessarily ask them because people never know what they want. <laughs> um, but if you listen to them, they will tell you what they want and then you create something for them, whether it is a free or paid resource and you go like that, building your little project, product suite. <laughs> okay, awesome. And uh, I guess for all the listeners, uh, Andrea's website is itsatravelod.com. When, when did you start the site, Andrea? 
So it's a travelod.com app. Actually, as soon as I convinced my bosses back in 2015 to let me uh, go remote, I started it to travelod.com because in my head I was going to be overdosing in travel and traveling a lot. So that's where the name came from. And then I just kept it because I like I built this platform and all this social media. Um, I, I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, and I'm on, I'm on YouTube now. And it's all, it's a travel OG everywhere. So I, I, I it could be something more related to remote work now because that's mostly what I focus on right now. But we're keeping it to travel OG. <laughs> Okay, got it. And the uh, the directory for remote jobs is a uh, it's it's part of it's a travelod.com, right? So it's a travelod.com slash find dash remote dash jobs. That's the main yeah. way to get to it. Yeah, you can actually find it as wantremotejobs.com. So okay. that's a little bit easier. Wantremotejobs.com, or if you go to it's a travelod.com, you'll see um, a, a button there to go straight to the directory. Yeah, and I'm looking at it now, um, and there's uh, you kind of separate things by industry a little bit. You have accounting and finance jobs, admin jobs, customer service jobs. So I thought maybe the next uh, direction we could take this discussion, design and HR, et cetera, as well, is how do people get their first remote job? A big question, but I, I imagine it's one that you've thought of a lot. Yes, totally. So a lot of people think that in order to get their first remote job, they have to learn some sort of fancy or advanced or like technology skill. But that is not the case because nowadays there are so many companies that have gone fully remote, which means that every department in the company is remote. So from social media to HR to IT to accounting, they're all working remotely. So nowadays you can find remote jobs in every industry. For example, when we were uh, faced with the pandemic, right, a lot of people who were like, maybe someone was an accountant, right, they had to learn the tools to continue to do their job, but from home, they didn't have to suddenly learn social media or coding or SEO in order to continue to work remotely, right? It's the same thing for people who want to transition to remote work. It's not about learning new skills that you might think are relevant to remote jobs. It's about learning tools. That means programs, software, apps that are going to allow you to do the same job that you do now, but remotely. So the first step is not to learn a new skill or to go in, into a coding boot camp or to learn about social media. No, if what you do right now is accounting, you learn tools. You identify the skills that you already have, and then you start researching what kind of tools you need to learn to you know, find your remote job in your field. That's the easiest way to get started. Mm -hmm. And what about people that don't have a skill that easily translates to online? Let's say they're a construction worker or something. How can they sort of you know, recreate their careers and, and start working online? So there is the, the misconception that there are no entry-level uh, remote jobs, but there's a ton of entry-level remote jobs. For example, the first person that I ever helped land a remote job was my brother because I was like, come here, I'm going to practice with you. <laughs> so this was in 2019, and he at the time was 20 years old. He did not have a degree at that, at that time. He had only worked as a waiter and in a call center for like three months. Um, he did speak English because English is pretty necessary in order to find the good paying remote jobs. So that, that that's mm -hmm. necessary. Um, but yeah, he didn't have a degree. He didn't have experience that was relevant to remote jobs, really. And we are not U.S. citizens because that is something that a lot of people also think. Like if you're not a U.S. citizen or, or the, yeah, like if you're not a U.S. citizen, you can't find remote jobs. But right now there are so many companies that have systems in place to hire remote workers worldwide, that that is not a problem. So with my brother, for example, I was like, okay, let's figure out what you've done. He'd had, I mean, he hadn't done a lot, but he had a little bit of customer service. So I was like, okay, we can go that route. Please, in your free time, start learning some of the tools that are used in remote work environments. So that is something that you can do. Learning a tool 
is a lot easier and faster than learning a skill. Usually to learn a skill, you need like experience or you need a degree or, you know, that is a lot harder. Uh, but in order to learn a tool, you literally do YouTube tutorials. You, like if you go, if, if you want to learn a project management tool, you just go to the project management tools website. You watch videos that they have on there, read their FAQs, uh, download it on your phone, play around with it, and boom, now suddenly you know a project management tool that is used commonly on, in a lot of remote work environments. So if you can devote time to learning new tools that are used in remote jobs, so for example, you can start with basic ones, like everyone should know Zoom, <laughs> um, everyone should know the, everything in the Google workspace, so you know Google Docs, Google yeah, Calendars, right. Pretty Jeez, easy. <laughs> all of that. So basic ones, those like those are the ones we want you to start with. The basic ones that you need to know for pretty much every job that it remote that's remote, right? So then right. after that, you go. So you into can like, use a computer, you can use Zoom, you can use Excel. Exactly. But, you, but you're still a construction worker, uh, just as an example. Now what? Yeah. So next up. So okay. So after you know some tools. Then you, there are a lot of entry level remote jobs in like customer support, which are not asking you to know any tools other than being able to communicate with people online using these tools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's something that you could start with. Um, a lot of people are starting with like admin virtual assistant, uh, mm -hmm. remote jobs or customer support, customer service. So those, that's a, a good way to start. If you are a little bit more tech savvy and you know a little bit of social media, you can start as like a community manager uh, supporting a marketing or social media team. So there are ways to start, but you do need to be a little bit tech savvy. I mean, um, as much as I would like to say that anyone can work remotely, if you can't figure out how to like work the internet and <laughs> different tools, then it's going to be a struggle. So if you are a little bit tech savvy, if you are willing to learn new tools, then you, you have a shot at landing a, an entry level remote job. Okay, cool. So uh, I guess to recap, uh, customer service and administrative assistance and basically anything where we just need a native English speaker who can answer the phone or respond to emails and stuff like that, do Correct. basic yeah. tasks. Yeah, so people are starting also with um, like appointment booking. That's a appointment bookers. That's something that's very uh, popular. So Center something like that for sales um, or to begin. With is this like a sales uh, appointment no, it's booker? Really or? Just booking appointments. People, <laughs> um, you use a, some sort of calendar app. Um, people reach out to you via email, or you do like customer service via email and book people's appointments and manage calendars. That was my brother's first job. <laughs> so, so yeah, that is something that's out there and it's mm -hmm. literally called appointment booker in some companies. Okay, cool. So these sort of non-technical administrative online jobs, um, sound like a good entry point. Yeah. Um, my thought though is wouldn't this be like super competitive and, and then once you get into it, it might be like low paying. I, I guess that's a bad perspective because you're going to learn a lot and you'll be able to up your skill set over time. But I, I imagine it's pretty competitive to get some of these uh, customer service type roles. It could be. Uh, however, I always say that finding remote jobs when you're starting out, it's just like in the real world. Like if you have no experience and you maybe just graduated high school, you're not going to get the best job of your life or uh, or get paid $100,000 per year, right? You have to start, you have to gain more experience, learn more tools, then you add it to your resume and then you start growing from there. So, I mean, of course, I like to like motivate everyone and and show them that remote jobs are doable. But we need to be realistic, and I'm all, I always try to be really transparent about this. If you have zero experience and you're just starting out, you are not going to get your dream job. You cannot be super picky with the first remote job. Like my first remote job, um, it, I, I didn't have flexible schedules. I like it was, I, I, I didn't get any benefits. Like it wasn't perfect in that sense. And I already had some experience, but I needed that remote job to learn new tools, new skills, add them to my resume, 
or just to find new opportunities on my own, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, step by step. Okay, cool. So we're down to get the uh, the admin job, maybe account executive, business operations rep, um, all this type of stuff, right? Um, how do we go about it? Like, what's the best best strategy for uh, finding these jobs and applying and, and going through the process? Right. So after you identify your skills, you need to make sure that you are applying with resumes that are made specifically for remote jobs. That is a mistake that people make often. Like, oh, I've applied to 20 remote jobs and I haven't had uh, any callbacks. And then I see their resume and their resume is the same resume they were using to get jobs in person. So they do not mention anything that's related to remote work. Like, for example, if you worked during the pandemic, you can add that as remote work experience to your resume. You can add the tools that you know, the, the skills that you know that are relevant. So that would be one of the first steps to make sure that your resume is made for uh, remote jobs. Because, of course, like you were saying, a lot of these jobs are going to be competitive. So in order to stand out, you have to show them that you would be able to, that, they, that they're not going to have to train you on the basics of remote job, like teaching you how to use a project management tool, for example, right? So if you add that as a tool to your, to your resume, that's going to give you a little bit of, a, of an advantage there. So the resume needs to be up to par. Then uh, there are a lot of companies that are called remote first companies. If you go to their career pages, you are going to be able to find out a lot of different positions. Now, uh, it all depends also if you want to do like a full-time remote job and get the benefits. And usually those are going to have the more competitive salaries because then the other option where some people also think that they, they have to start at is as a freelancer. And freelancing sometimes scare people because that means you have to find your own clients, market yourself, like be in a bunch of freelancing platforms, applying to a bunch of different gigs that are not well paid or that are just like temporary. So I want to remind people that freelancing is not the only way to go when it comes to finding uh, or working remotely. You can yeah. find remote jobs that are full time. And that is just going to be like, if you worked nine to five in a traditional job, but you would be doing it online. So for the people who are worried about like stability and the, you know, the stress of freelancing, there is that option out there. So full-time remote jobs are out there. And Let's and double click on that. So I think uh, because uh, maybe someone listening to this, they're getting hit from all different angles and there's, yeah. they probably follow a bunch of freelancer people and a bunch of FBA people and remote work advocates and stuff. And they don't know if they, if they need to freelance or if it's possible to get a full-time job, what's your stance on what's better? Do you, it sounds like you're typically um, you're typically advocating that people start with full time jobs and not freelancing, right? Correct. So I think that the easiest way to get started working remotely is with a remote job working for a company. So mm -hmm. just like you would in the real world, where you uh, graduate and then maybe get an a, a, an internship. There are remote internships too. <laughs> then there are entry level remote jobs too. So you can start with any of those too. And then, you know, working for a company, you learn, you get the new skills, and then you grow from there. So that is the easiest way to learn because a lot of people are not comfortable with freelancing, marketing themselves, yeah. finding clients, then running around to make sure they get paid um, and all of that. So usually. Yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, Freelancing yeah. is freelancing is definitely a bit of a grind, um, whereas uh, I, I think a, a remote job is is definitely a better fit. And and you got to focus like you can't be looking for freelance stuff and full time job stuff. I think you probably need to focus right. Yes, and there are a lot of people out there, um, Instagram gurus or other coaches <laughs> that will tell you like the benefits of freelancing. And sure, there are benefits. But you get a lot of the flexibility and all those benefits working full time remotely also. And it's mm -hmm. easier to land and it's less of a, a hustle and a, a grind, like you were saying. So I actually started with a full time remote job 
then when I felt like I had a lot or more experience, then I was like, okay, let me uh, try out freelancing. And I did that for a few years. And I thought that was not very conducive to work-life balance. So, <laughs> so I actually enjoyed more my time when I was, when I had a full-time remote job, it was a steady income and it was not just me like trying to get clients all the time and all that. Um, and then the, I mean, there are other ways to work remotely also, like if you own a business, if you're running your own company, but then that would be like step three, you know? So step one is landing a remote job. Then maybe step two is freelancing, then maybe owning a business. And you do not have to do all of them. Like it's depending on your style and what you want to do. And some people are happy doing a full-time uh, job, remote job for, for a long time, because there are very uh, well-paying remote jobs out there. Like if you are at a senior level, there are a bunch of companies at hiring at senior level. So you can't totally just stay uh, working full-time remote jobs if that's your style. Okay, cool. So we've settled that full-time remote job is probably the best path. And we've talked about some of the entry-level options in terms of you know customer service manager and um, administrative assistant type roles. So how does someone, and, and we've also talked about, you know, having your resume sort of be adapted for that type of role and make it seem right. like you have experience working remote and stuff. Right. Um, oh, you mentioned uh, uh, remote first companies versus like hybrid companies and stuff like that. Do you have a, do you have a preference? Should people be um, uh, only apl applying for remote remote? roles that specifically state that they're remote and companies that specifically state that they're hundred percent remote or yeah. like, is there, is there other opportunities with maybe like hybrid companies or maybe a role that says it's on site or half time and maybe you can negotiate to be remote. I don't know. Do you have any stances on that? Right. So I think that's kind of like a personal preference. So for example, if it were for me and my lifestyle, I would only want a 100% remote job because I never want to go to an office, right? <laughs> but there are some people who like the office life and like the, you know, having co No, 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 no. We don't advocate that. <laughs> we don't We don't want anyone going to office. I almost, <laughs> meant, I almost meant like, what if it said it's like you just apply to jobs that say they're um, on-site jobs, but then just be like, look. I'm going to do this remote and try to like negotiate and maybe you have less competition that way. Cause less, there's less people applying. I don't know. Well, that's going to be harder. I think that if you're starting and you want a remote job, then you should go straight, straight to applying for remote jobs. So there are companies that are fully remote and they're not necessarily remote first. So you can start with some of those remote first are the companies that really like, um, empower their employees to work remotely and maybe they're async and all that. So they go like one step like further into like the whole work-life balance thing. So I would say try the 100% remote companies, uh, you know, fully remote and the remote first companies. I would focus just on those. I wouldn't focus on any other hybrid or try to negotiate <laughs> after you've okay. gotten it. Because so, I think so focus on 100% remote jobs yeah. from 100% remote companies. Correct. Yes. Uh, and all the, the jobs that I find that I post on my directory are actually remote, uh, fully remote co uh, jobs at fully remote companies. I find like at least 10 per week and I add them on there. So I know there are a lot of options out there. <laughs> there are. There are. Yes. Just doing a little uh, devil's, devil's advocate stuff totally. just in case. Just to like absolutely focus in people on what they should be doing. Yes, totally. <laughs> okay. So hundred percent remote jobs. Uh, so we kind of know what we're doing now. Now, how does one go about applying to all these uh, remote jobs? How many applications should they do a day? What does it kind of look like? What does maybe the process look like? Are they going to start setting up um, dozens of uh, screening calls and interviews a week? Or let's, let's start walking through the, the taking action part. Yeah. So, I mean, it's going to depend on how much free time people have. Like if you are currently fully employed and you have two kids, then you might not have as much time as someone who is unemployed and ready to like 
land a remote job as soon as possible. So it depends on how much time you can devote to it. But I generally recommend you, you know, once you have your resume ready and your cover letter, cover letter ready for remote jobs, you can start applying to three to five remote jobs per week. Uh, from what I've seen from my course members, once they join the course, they are landing a remote job like four to six months later. So on average, that's how long it's taking them. So Really? The, Isn't that yeah. a long time? Four to six months from when they start looking? Yes, yes. It's not that fast. I'm not going to lie to anyone and tell them that they're going to land a remote job tomorrow. If you already have remote work experience, it might be a little bit faster. If you already know how to find the remote jobs and your resume is ready, it might be a little bit faster. But I am usually helping out people who have never worked remotely and have no idea how this works. So maybe the first two months they're spending going through the course content and learning like, oh, okay, I could do this. Oh, wait, I have this and this skill. And then they build their resume. So that is why it could take them a little bit longer than maybe if you wanted a remote job, you could probably get one in one month, right? <laughs> um, but yes, so first months will be about learning, identifying your skills, making your resume. Then you start applying for remote jobs. And from that point on, it might be two, three months if you're applying to three to five remote jobs per week, which is what I recommend. Okay, gotcha. And do you think that people could um, accelerate that timeline if they applied to more jobs on a weekly basis? 100%. So I have I have had people who've joined the course and they've landed a remote job one month later. And I'm like, whoa, how did this happen? And they were like, first of all, I finished the course in one week because I'm like, I'm just going to go in full force and then I'm going to apply to a lot of you know jobs per day. So it depends on everyone and how much time they have and how bad they want it. Because of course, I uh, give you all, I give people all the tools that they need, but it's usually up to them to actually, you know, do the work and apply to the jobs because I teach you how to do it, but I'm not, I don't apply to the jobs mm. for you. <laughs> and uh, Andrea, so, so why actually do you recommend applying to so few jobs, just three, four or six per week? Is it because they're doing very hyper targeted jobs and they're, I don't know, DMing the CEO on LinkedIn and um, I don't know, being more creative about their applications or is that just like a typical like Indeed LinkedIn application or why, why so few? Because you could do like 100 plus a week easy. Totally. So number one, I don't want to overwhelm anyone. <laughs> People get really stressed out if you tell them that you have to, they have to apply to 100 remote jobs per week and then they're like, okay, this is not for me. I can't do it. <laughs> so number one, I try to keep it realistic. Okay. So if you are personalizing your resume and your cover letter for each shop that you're applying, it's not going to take five minutes. It's going to take a little bit more. So also I don't want you to apply to all kinds of crazy jobs just because you saw them somewhere. I want you to be a little bit more strategic and apply to remote jobs that are, that actually look like a great fit, right? So the people, I mean, if you can apply to more of the, to more, uh, that would be awesome. Sure. But with people, how I've seen them and sometimes they have a full-time job with while they're doing this, I think three to five is realistic and it will eventually get you there <laughs> without having you all overwhelmed and exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I guess just kind of baby step people into it, but especially yeah. if you're doing like the easy apply type jobs where it's like really only takes not even a minute, 30 seconds right. to apply to a job. There's no reason. Cause I think, I think volume is important. It sounds like, I don't know if you maybe emphasize more volume like later once people get into a flow, but I think like you, you really do need a lot of volume. Definitely. But there's another thing. I don't particularly recommend uh, websites like Indeed and LinkedIn <laughs> to find remote jobs. So for someone who was more experienced working remotely, so you, for example, I know that you would be able to go to LinkedIn and 100% tell if a job is an online scam. Okay. Or you, if you start filtering out uh, the different jobs that they have, you would perfectly be able to know if a job is going to be hybrid or if it's going to be fully remote, right? Um, 
but people who are starting out, you have no idea how much they struggle with this. They see anything that is selling them this dream and that looks like too good to be true and they think it's real. So at the beginning, for people who are starting out, I am like, it's better off. You're going to be better off if you stay away from LinkedIn and Indeed because you find so many online scams on there. So what you would really? do instead yeah. is you would go to uh, remote job directories and sites and boards that are specific for remote jobs. There are so many out there, not just mine. So I always tell people, do your research, find the ones that are specific for remote jobs and focus on those because most of the times those are going to be pre-screened jobs. You are going to know that they are legit and you're not going to have to be uh, reading and seeing, okay, is this remote? Is this not remote? Is this only work from home, right? So mm -hmm. in this job sites and directories, it's so much more specific. So you are going to waste, uh, you're not going to waste time trying to, you know, filter out the scams and all that. So yeah, I always say stay away from LinkedIn and indeed if you are starting out because then you won't fall into some victim of into like so many scams. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Andrea, I think, uh, I've had a similar thought about Indeed. I haven't used Indeed recently, but I always remember it was like a little bit more fly by night in terms of the the easiness of putting up postings. Yeah. But I, I always thought LinkedIn was pretty good. I mean, um, I always thought LinkedIn, I don't know what they're doing in terms of their barriers to entry in terms of putting yeah. up postings. Maybe there's more scams in this administrative assistant type low skill jobs, but at right. least when it comes to IT and tech jobs, like yeah. I haven't really noticed a lot of scams and I, I've used the platform quite a lot in the past and I, years. Yes. I actually thought so too, but again, you and I have been working remotely for some time and are like, are, are, we navigate the, the internet with a lot more caution than people who are starting out. People who are starting out are really struggling with things like LinkedIn. And I know because a lot of my, not my, not my students, because I have a, like a full video training on like how to avoid online scams and how to identify them. So I'm like, okay, you guys are not going to fall into online scams if you're one of my students. Right. But a lot of my followers on TikTok, which is like a much more massive platform. And I have so many followers on there and they're usually like super beginners. Mm -hmm. They are like, I just got scammed on LinkedIn and I talk about LinkedIn and I will get hundreds of messages about how they got scammed on LinkedIn. Really? So wow. I just really started figuring out that if you are starting out, it's, it's better for you to just stick to the um, sites that are just publishing remote jobs so that this doesn't happen to you. <laughs> uh, and by the way, guys, uh, Andrea can be found on TikTok at it's a travel OD. She has, uh, as of uh, this recording, two, 280,000 followers on TikTok. So I guess that's probably by far your largest platform. It is. Actually, a lot of people who find me find, find me through TikTok. <laughs> I started like around in the pandemic. No, no, no. After the pandemic, I started actually. And I posted two TikToks a day. So if anyone out there who is listening to this is actually trying to like build uh, like a following, an email list or trying to do something like that, like generate leads. Insta um, sorry, TikTok is really good for that <laughs> because you reach so many people. You you get, you, you have the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it'd be fun to spend a minute talking about uh, common scams in uh, online job applications with, with Indeed and, and LinkedIn and, and other platforms. Do you want to run us through um, maybe some of the common scams that are out there and how they can be avoided? Yeah, so most of the times, if it sounds too good to be true, if it sounds too easy, then it's probably not real. Like if they're telling you that they're going to pay you $50 per email you send, that that's not normal, right? <laughs> then yes, that's not real. Also, if you see that anyone has like a lot of urgency to hire you immediately and they don't even need to like do an interview and, and they DM you and you didn't even apply and they come out of nowhere like, we are hiring immediately. So like join this link and we'll hire you. Like if it sounds like, like they're in a hurry, 
that's not a good sign. So if they if they don't do an interview with a video call, if you're not seeing someone in person and they're just trying to like hire you through a chat or something, that's usually not good. If you see a lot of typos, if you're talking to someone or if a post has a lot of typos, misspellings, grammar mistakes, that's also not a good sign. Um, what else? If uh, Also, you always have to do your research, right? Because a company might seem like they're real, but then you don't find them. You don't find a, like a legit website. Then you don't find them on social media. You don't find any employees that work there. Uh, maybe you don't find like any reviews. You can use like the uh, customer reviews of like something like Yelp or maybe the employee reviews of something like Glassdoor. So you have to do your research always whenever you are talking to anyone online. So just as they are going to stalk you to make sure that you're going to be real and that you're going to show up, uh, you also have to do your research on them. So those are a few quick things that are red flags i see oh and another so, big one wait one sorry one big one if they ask you for an upfront fee for anything <laughs> like for okay. background for check sure. for, yeah, that's kind of for equipment for like anything like that like it's just like in the real world you don't get paid to get hired in remote jobs you also don't get paid to get hired so never get never pay anyone <laughs> pay to get hired got it and um even though we're talking about full-time jobs like what percentage of them do you think are W-2 jobs versus 1099 jobs? In other words, full-time yeah. employee versus contractor. So I would say, so a lot, I would say 90% of the jobs that I find online and post in my directory are W-2. Uh, so I know there are a lot out there and I'm not saying there's one of more or the other, but I find a lot of the W-2 ones, which are the ones that you want if you want benefits and all that. And actually, the benefits are extended to people worldwide now. Uh, so, so yeah, there are a lot of W two options. Okay, and then just keeping on the topic of uh, avoiding scams. So, I would imagine that a lot of the scams are probably um, something to do with being a contractor, right, or getting paid in some sort of uh, creative way like you kind of said on a per email basis or maybe copywriter on a per wit per word basis or i don't know like uh, if it's sales you know it's like percentage of you know the sale or whatever but i imagine if it's w2 a w2 job that there's probably a lot less room to scam there right like uh, a lot of the scams, they won't give you a contract <laughs> and people are like, oh, it's it's fine. They say they'll pay me like every other. I'm like, whoa, 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 no, no, no. There's no contract. That's a problem. Right. So you always have to sign a contract. You always have to make An sure that there are uh, things set on there like a uh, like a schedule. <laughs> so just because you're working remotely doesn't mean uh, that you can that you're not gonna have a schedule. No, you still have business hours, and you have to establish those boundaries, and those should be in a, in a contract. So yeah, the 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 scams are usually like whenever I see them, I'm like, ah, this is like who who believes this? But people who are new at this, again, they're they might be like, oh, maybe this is how remote jobs work, or. Like they, they're telling me that they're just going to pay me commission. And I think that sounds cool or, you know, different things that, that, yeah, if it, if, it, if it doesn't sound like a serious job, just like it would in the real world, then it's probably not serious. <laughs> okay. So let's say someone can avoid, uh, you know, some pretty, pretty obvious scams. Have you heard of some like really clever ones? Yes, I have actually. Um, they, so there are company, there are. Okay, so there are people pretending to be a company that is established, right? So these are a little bit harder to, to tell that they're a scam because if you research them, they look like a real company because it is. It's just that the, that the person you're talking to is not part of that company. Does that make sense? So this person is stealing the, the like it, they're including the, the company website in their communication, of course, they're not going to. So, so maybe their email would be like if the company is called blah, blah, right? Then their email domain will be Andrea 
at blah, blah, one dot com. So you're like, oh, the domain name, they're using the domain name. So they're getting really creative. So especially when they're impersonating another company, that is when it gets a little bit trickier to, to see that, it, that it's a scam. They're getting clever. <laughs> So they're getting clever. And so what, what is the ultimate goal of these uh, scammers? And we'll move on after this. I don't want the whole episode to be about yeah. scamming, but it's, <laughs> it's kind of fun. But um, so like, what is the ultimate goal? Are they trying to get your social security number? Are they trying to get an upfront fee? Um, are they trying to just get a couple of weeks of free work out of you? What, what's the idea here? No, it's usually not free work. These people are not like real companies who want you to do work. <laughs> true, true, true. No, it's usually um, people who are trying to two things, either get your, some, your, your personal information or steal money from you. Sometimes all they want is that for you to pay them that $100 upfront fee that they claim is what they need to hire you, right? Um, and sometimes they will, you know, they, this scam where they send you checks and you have to cash them and blah, blah, blah. They are still doing that out there and people are still falling for that. Um, so they're like, this is part of your job as a virtual assistant. You're going to cash my checks. <laughs> so of course that is, oh, sometimes they make people buy equipment for them and then they'll reimburse it and then they won't reimburse it, of course. Mm. So yeah, if they make you do anything like that, it's weird. And be careful, of course, always when you're giving out your personal information because that sometimes that's all they want. Interesting. And so do you kind of recommend for people's first remote job, especially with this like administrative assistant type role that maybe they should target um, organizations of a, of a certain size and sophistication? So maybe like I think like if you're a software developer or something technical, um, perhaps it's more common to get a, a job with a company with like 10 employees or less. But maybe if you're an assistant, maybe you should try to go for for a, a bit of a bigger company. So I think it's a matter of applying to different kinds of jobs. So if you're applying to five jobs this week, maybe two are small companies, two are big companies, and one isn't in a different industry, you know? <laughs> um, so just, I say, change it up a little bit. And I think you never know, really. Like some people might be looking i know i i, I can't really say for sure <laughs> yeah what it's it all shapes and sizes a little bit yeah so what is the uh what is the like what does a typical job uh hiring process look like for a remote call how many um interviews might they expect in a typical process uh before receiving uh an offer and maybe you could just kind of quickly walk through like all the steps from from, I guess, the application to, to, you know, the start date. Right. So again, it's going to depend on the company because they all have different like processes, but for the most part, they are going to have like maybe three interviews. Um, maybe one of them is going to be some sort of async type of interview, meaning that they'll send you maybe forms to fill out, um, interviews like video like you have to record a video for example and send it like you're not necessarily meeting someone in person and that might be the first step right or you might do like an assessment or some sort of test that might be the first step um then you usually meet up with maybe two or three people this would be in a period of like two weeks to a month I mean, it's so different from company to company that I cannot say for sure. Of course, if the company is smaller, uh, the process is going to be quicker most of the times. And maybe you're just going to meet with two people. Uh, and then if the company is bigger, you're going to meet with your direct boss, then someone in HR, then the owner that, you know, so it depends. But again, it is really it's a good sign if you are meeting with different people online and meeting them in person, sort of like, sort of, no. So looking at their face. Video, <laughs> video interview. Yeah. So, so that's a good thing. Um, and then also I would say, try to get comfortable with talking in like to a camera. So that, because all your interviews are going to be talking to a camera, whether that is a recorded video or like it's with someone live. Right. So if you are trying to find remote jobs, just record yourself 
like talking about your skills and all that, just as practice, because the more relaxed but still confident that you come across, the better chance you're going to get. So those are little things you can do to practice, right? So it's very different <laughs> for every company, but but yeah, that's a little bit of how it could go. Okay, so you do the the three calls. You talk to a, diff- a couple different people, different stakeholders, quote unquote, yeah. the boss, etc. And then, uh, and then what happens? And then you're usually going to get an offer, <laughs> and you need to have a contract. Okay, if you do not have a contract that states everything, uh, your benefits, your salary, your business hours. Uh, and all of that, then it's not good, right? So make sure that you're getting an offer and then a contract. Okay, cool. And then so you get a, a contract, uh, you get like a salary, um, you know, they, they they name a salary there. Um, yeah. Maybe if it's entry level, it's, I don't know, what, what would that be like 60K, 80K a year, maybe less? Um, uh, maybe less, yes. Maybe, if it's for entry level, it's for entry level. And then do you, do you recommend that people negotiate that offer um, or should they just sign it immediately? Well, it's, it's sometimes that depends on, on what each person wants. Maybe some people feel like that is more, if it's more than you earned and the competitive, like the, the salary is competitive and you're feeling like the benefits are an upgrade from what you currently have and you feel comfortable with that, then sure, you can accept it right away. You can always give a counter offer, um, but that is a little bit more. This overwhelms people a lot <laughs> whenever I tell them. So I'm like, okay, let's take it step by step. And this is something that I cover a little bit about in the course too. But I'm like, do not jump to the module five whenever we are in mod if you're if you're still you know starting out because it's gonna get overwhelming so little by little <laughs> okay so it sounds like you're leaning towards not negotiating the offer um signing it and then um i guess you have a start date talk us through a little bit more of these dynamics just because some people might be unfamiliar with it or they really only go through it like once every two, three, five years. So it kind of maybe changes over time. Are they gonna are they gonna send you a laptop? Are you gonna use your own laptop? Um, how do you choose a start date? Do you wanna just walk through a, a couple more mechanics here? Yeah, so in most companies you are not going to get equipment. Okay, so you have to come in with your own equipment. The good thing is that for entry level remote jobs and even for like mid level remote jobs, you do not need like the most advanced or the most expensive equipment in order to do your job, right? So, with the laptop that you have, you are probably going to be able to perform your duties just fine. There are companies, especially the remote first companies, and those will offer equipment. So, they'll provide equipment and software, and they'll even provide things like, um, uh, reimbursement or a stipend for uh, your internet and maybe a co-working space if you want to go to one and all those things but that is for remote first companies and not all do so yeah you would usually well the start date is something that gets negotiated also like it, it also depends on on each case like for example one thing that i saw during the holidays I was telling people to apply during the holidays because Mm -hmm. most people don't because they're focusing on their vacations. And then all these people, as soon as like January 3rd came around, they started getting callbacks for the, for the jobs that they applied to. Right. So it's a good idea to apply kind of like in, in in times where people are on vacation. Mm -hmm. And then these people were getting callbacks for interviews after the holidays. And then they were getting, uh, for those who got hired, start dates in like mid January. So, um, some like I, a lot of people in December were worried that if they applied, they were going to get hired and you know have to start working during Christmas and New Year's. But that start date was something that was negotiated, and they could start afterwards. Okay. I'm surprised that you said that most people have to bring their own laptop. Yeah. Um, I think in IT, that has not been my experience at all. Like they really want you to use a company laptop. And I find it's not because they want to implement tracking software or anything necessarily. I think it's more of like a, 
IP intellectual property issue or something. Right. Yes, it could be a little different for IT jobs, but for the kinds of remote jobs that people who are starting out are looking for, are looking for, they're usually not providing any equipment. Okay, good to know. I'm a. Uh, that's a good sort of like distinction to make based on yeah. industry. And then and the ones that that are are going to mention it as benefits in the job description. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, that's awesome. I I feel like we've walked people the the whole way through a lot of these things. Yes. <laughs> And it it can sound really overwhelming, especially if you are starting out. But that is why I have like a five-step process, which is basically everything we've talked about. And I advise people to just take it step by step and don't jump to step five whenever you're in step one. So yeah, if you you do it with guidance and you know, and you have the support of someone who has done it before and you have the tools, it's something that is very doable, even if you feel like it's something so new to you. Mm-hmm. Do you have a pulse on on the salary situation uh, for for these non technical roles and entry level roles? Could you maybe speak to that? Because you know a lot of these listeners they don't they don't have someone that they can go to and say like, "Hey, is my offer fair?" Blah blah blah. So it might be helpful for them to hear what what they might realistically expect or if they're starting to get offers, how it might compare to what you're seeing in the industry. So I struggle with giving exact numbers because it's a lot of the times it's going to depend on the company. Sometimes they're looking for people in specific locations and then that's going to be different. So I don't know if a listener here, if they're in the U S or if they're in, you know, somewhere else. Um, It's also going to depend on the experience of the person or it's it's tricky to give exact numbers because I feel like I might be like, uh, like I don't know, exciting someone thinking that they're going to get that in their first remote job, but maybe they don't have experience or maybe someone who is senior might hear something and they're like, okay, I was expecting more. Um, uh, unfortunately, not a lot of jobs have the salary <laughs> on the job description, which is something that would be awesome if people, if all the recruiters and employers did. So, I, I've noticed that sometimes in the first screening call, like they'll give you a range or yes. especially if it's like uh, a third party recruiter, they'll say like, Hey, right. can we, can we submit you at this price range? Um, that'd be if it's a third party recruiter or if it's like an internal recruiter, they'd say like, Hey, this is what we're thinking. Is that, is that something that you'd like accept if we made it to the end of the line? Yes, and, and it's always awesome to discuss it as soon as possible whenever you've already been selected for like, you know, after the for the first step. So that would be a great uh, great point to discuss this. But yeah, uh, it, it's hard to tell because like not even the job descriptions are mentioning exactly what the the salaries might be. Okay. And That's I don't know fair. if the person listening is starting out or if they have 10 years of experience with an in-demand skill. So hmm, it's, it's fair. hard. That's fair. Oh, I think one other thing we might have uh, skipped over would be background checks. Um, do you want to maybe speak to how background checks might work in the States or, or internationally for, for international applicants? Um, but I guess primarily in the States. Like, do they, is, that, is a background check super common for these entry level non-technical roles because i know it's pretty much a necessity in the it space no it's actually not common at all (laughs) um not a lot of companies are running background checks for entry level remote jobs um and if you're international it's also so hard to actually do run a background check if someone is uh somewhere else so it's not something that is as common so don't I, I'm surprised. So even for US applicants, they're not running it? Like it's not it can't be that expensive to run. I actually don't know how much it costs, but probably like less than two hundred bucks. Why would why would they not be running them? I have no idea, but it's not common. I I I don't hear a lot of my students saying that they got a, a background check. So I would say maybe twenty twenty percent of them are getting background checks. And this is when it's like for a remote first company and it's usually for like a mid-level or senior level uh, position that they start doing the checks yes whenever they're like whenever they're going to trust you with a lot of like more confidential information and all that then they will 
if it's an entry level remote job in which you're going to be doing like basic customer service, it, it won't usually happen. <laughs> all right, all my felons out there, entry level remote jobs. <laughs> I actually, you have no idea how many comments I get, especially on TikTok, about people who are watching my content from jail and getting ready for when what? they come out. Yep. From jail. Yes, I'm always like, wait, they so they so they have access to phones and TikTok inside of jail. But this is what they comment. They're like, hey, how do you think it, it's gonna work for me once I get out of jail? Like, will I be able to land a remote job? <laughs> and um, sometimes, I, sometimes I literally don't know what to say because I don't have these answers. Maybe um, they can start from jail. They can start while they're still in jail because it's remote. I mean, but but will they have a laptop though? And will they be able to? <laughs> they have a phone phone based job. <laughs> but will they be able to actually work eight hours a, a day and all that? I don't know. <laughs> you ask for permission, right? Oh my god. Yeah, but I do. I I have gotten a lot of those messages, um, and I'm like, well, I don't know what to say here. Jeez. Oh god. Yeah. You that see a lot funny. of things. Sometimes some, uh, someone recently asked me, like, "Hey, if I have a full face tattoo, can I get a remote job?" And I'm like, "Actually, you can." <laughs> Like most, like if you are not going to be client facing people, they're probably not going to care. So yeah, I, I get, I get a lot of interesting questions. <laughs> interesting. Um, any sort of uh, additional anecdotes or thoughts on the, the job application process that you wanted to, to mention before we maybe switch, switch themes? Yeah, I think a lot of people, like I've been saying before, like to jump to like step number 27 when they haven't even started number one so for example the other day i got a dm of someone asking me hey what kind of ergonomic chair do you recommend for me whenever i do land my first remote job and i was like hey did you already start your remote job search and they're like no <laughs> and i'm like wait why are we wor worrying about the chair when you still don't have the remote job so stop worrying about like sometimes you see people on instagram and social media who make you feel like you should be further ahead so now that i have a home office some people are like oh so if i don't have a home office i won't be able to work remotely and i'm like girl i have a home office seven years after i started working remotely i was working from couch my uh, different couches my bed uh co-working spaces and all that before so yeah don't think that you need the fancy equipment the home office or that you need to have things figured out like how are you going to do your taxes like first land the remote job then you are going to get a tax specialist or an accountant or in the case of full-time remote jobs they're even going to maybe help you with that so step by step <laughs> okay cool yeah kind of uh, a good uh, segue into how i wanted to wrap up the episode a bit is we didn't talk too much about your adventures and <laughs> where you've lived and the transition from nomad to slow mad so i thought yeah. maybe to end the episode now that people have the playbook we could give them a little inspiration in what what they could look forward to. So where where have you lived? I guess since two thousand fifteen was because uh, I know you've lived in Argentina, Hawaii, a bunch of different spots. Yes. So I started in Hawaii. Then I was like, I want to go to a place I've never been before, and I ended up in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So I was there for like six months. I still had my full time remote uh, job, the first one, while I was there. And I was still getting used to the whole working while traveling thing. That's also a, a thing that I always tell people. Like if you just got your first remote job, don't go and schedule in six different countries in the next three months because then you are not going to be able to balance both and you are going to neglect your job and potentially lose it. So be very uh, careful with the traveling at the beginning so that it is sustainable and that you don't forget your job because it's not a vacation, right? <laughs> then after Buenos Aires, I moved to uh, Mexico City. That was the first time I came to Mexico City and I loved it. Then I went to Playa del Carmen and I was there for like maybe six months. Then my mom actually retired and moved to a mountain in Panama, Boquete. I don't uh -huh. know if you've heard of Boquete yeah, in yeah. Panama. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I moved to Boquete with my mom and that place is so, well, right now it has a lot more life and people and things going on. But when I was there, like in 2016 or 17, it was very slow. It was great for people who are retired. So that is when I wrote my first book because I just had so much free time and it was so kind of boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, Boquete, Panama. Then I moved back to Playa del Carmen because if you've been to Playa del Carmen, it's just a lot of things to do and so many places to visit around and a big digital nomad community. So it's easy to meet people and, and have fun things to do. Then I went on my like full on digital nomad era <laughs> because I literally moved uh, to different countries every month or different cities. So I did like Buenos Aires, Argentina again, Santiago, Chile, uh, Lima, Peru. Uh, then I did Cali, Colombia. Then I did uh, did Medellin. Then Monterrey. Um, so that was in the space of like eight months, like just like going, going, going. And mm -hmm. actually, that is when I decided, oh my god, this was too much. I'm exhausted, <laughs> and I actually didn't work as much during those those months because I you know you want to explore and sightsee but then uh, you also need to sleep and work and work out and you know it's hard to balance all those things together so yeah just travel slow as much as you can that is what I realized in those eight months so then after that I um, I decided I wanted to slow down and I moved to Mexico City So this was the my favorite place out of all the cities I visited in Latin America. Actually, it's my favorite city in Latin America. So I bought an apartment here. In, well, I moved here in 2019. Then the pandemic happened. So I had to stay here. <laughs> And then I bought my, my apartment here. So now I am a person with a home base that travels whenever she can. But... I it's like a like a normal person they have a home base they travel and come back <laughs> so it's not on um, like full on traveling anymore even though I have you know the flexibility and freedom I just like like the slow life and the slow mornings and the now I'm someone who is prioritizing a lot of like self-care and health and wellness and all that Um, instead of like the traveling, traveling, which is also a great perk of working remotely that you can just have so much time for self-care and your hobbies and all that. And why, why Mexico City? What makes it your favorite city in Latin America? Well, I could go on and on. It's number one. Everything is very convenient. Like if you want anything delivered, you can have that. That is not a possibility in a lot of Latin cities. Um, so whenever you come here after going in, going to Latin cities where that's not possible, you really appreciate those things. I feel actually very safe. I, as a solo female traveler and all that, I've been to a lot of places in Latin America when I'm like, Oh, I don't know if I want to walk around even in during the day or like here comfortably in Mexico city. I've never felt that. Um, of course, you have to be careful everywhere you go, but for the most part, I feel like it's very safe. Um, the cost of living is good. Also, um, the weather, I think it's awesome. Also, there's so much to do. I love going to concerts, and there are so many concerts here. I love going, I love eating, <laughs> and there are so many different types of restaurants, international, local, everything you can imagine. Um, I also love to travel and the Mexico City airport is close to the city and you can go to a lot of places. Um, I also love working out and trying out different like types of workouts and they have everything here. Like right now I am going to bar class. I do tap dancing. I also find found ceramics workshops. Like there's so much to do here. You, you It's a place where you won't get bored. The food is awesome. People are nice. I could keep going on and on, but I'll stop. <laughs> no, that's awesome. I think uh, that'll help inspire people. I'm looking at the like Panama Panama citizen visa restrictions. It's actually a very good passport. Like you get all of Latin America except yeah. for Venezuela, uh, visa free Europe as well, visa free yeah. Russia, um, quite a few spots in uh, Southeast Asia too. And yeah. I was just kind of curious, um, uh, like why you choose to continue being 
living or and traveling primarily in Latin America, and, um, and maybe why not Europe or or Asia? What keeps you in the Latin America region? I actually have no idea. <laughs> I don't know why, why I've stayed around here. I guess at the beginning, when I wasn't making as much money, I it was just cheaper to be around here. Um, now that I have a little bit more flexibility and I'm more comfortable, I could be going to more places. But now, since I just bought the apartment, I also have slowed down a little bit of uh, my traveling because I have prioritized just furnishing my apartment, for example. Um, so... So yeah, I think those are, are places that I'm going to want to go to and come back, um, like just like travel and come back, but not, I'm not really into the staying for six months and three months in, in places anymore. So yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Are you going to try to become a Mexican citizen when the day comes? So actually I, I am three years into my temporary resident, mm -hmm. uh, like per, like visa situation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, in this year, I can apply to the permanent resident one. Mm -hmm. So in August. And then after that, I don't know what's next. What happens after that? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't researched. Um, well, you can apply after five years of total residency. So you'll renew as permanent this year. And then uh, just one more year of waiting. And then you can apply for citizenship. There we go. So maybe I'll... So the, the problem is that I am already a Panamanian and Colombian citizen. My mom is from Colombia. Uh, so I have both of those passports. And I am pretty sure I would have to give one up, which wouldn't be a problem. I, I, I don't know think so. I don't think so. I think you could, I think you could keep three? them all. Yeah. There are some which you can't keep three, but I don't know. You know, I haven't, I haven't thought about it that far. I, I don't so. think Colombia will care. Potentially Panama because they're kind of one I of the more, not, more I would never give up my Panama citizenship. No. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I think – I know. I think I think it'll probably be good. I think it'll be good. Okay, that's something I'll think about. Like I am someone who who like goes with the flow and thinks about things like later when when you have to when when you're forced to think to like actually have to think about them. So I haven't thought about that yet. But when the time comes, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, and then one question, because you bring up Colombia, it sounds like you haven't spent too much time as a digital nomad living in Colombia, even though it probably checks some of your boxes in terms of like low cost of living and decent weather and, and stuff like that. Is it just because it's too close of a culture to Panama and you wanted something different or why, why not so much Colombia? Um, that's interesting. Um, so, so yeah, I, actually my brother who works remotely lives in Medellin and I, I just don't enjoy Colombia as much. <laughs> just a personal preference. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's funny. It, it's, um, it, it's always good to, to collect people's perspectives. And, um, I, I definitely tend to agree with you as well. I'm more of a Mexico fan than a Colombia fan. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of remote workers love Medellin, um, uh, but yes, it's just not my, my style. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. trying to think what else as we, uh, we get to wrapping up here. Um, what, what, it, like, what about the remote work lifestyle do you absolutely love? Like the freedom and, um, you've allu alluded to this a little bit in, in your content, but like, just, just inspire people one more time about the freedom and the, and the things that make it like an amazing lifestyle. Yeah. So I remember before I had a remote job, I was a person whose life literally revolved around that job. And I did not have a lot of hobbies or fun things going on outside of that because sometimes I was too exhausted coming from work, you know, later in the day to do something fun. Or even on the weekends, I was I prefer like sleeping because I was tired or I had to run errands that I couldn't do during the week, you know? So being able to really have work-life balance is one of the most important things for me because like literally you have this one life and if you are just going to live to work, that in my opinion is really depressing. <laughs> so I, for me, it's the freedom, the flexibility, being able to make your own schedules, to prioritize your health, 
your wellness, your hobbies, do more fun things. That is the best thing about it. And like, for example, I, I just wouldn't be someone who's able to go back to an office, even if they offered me three times what I'm making now. Like, there's no way. It's just too much of a life upgrade to be able to make your own schedules and have flexibility and freedom to give that up. So that, that is why I'm also so passionate about working remotely because I see so many of the people who work remotely just experience this life upgrade and go from like boring life to doing something more exciting, go from like having unhealthy patterns to suddenly having time to work out and make their own meals at home so they feel better. Mm -hmm. I also know people who say that they have had, a, it has had a really good impact on their mental health because while you're working at an office, maybe you do not have a lot of, you don't have the luxury to take a personal day off uh, just because you're not feeling well that day, you know? So, so there are so many benefits to working remotely. And I think um, if you, if you have the opportunity, definitely try and take the risk because I have not seen one person who tells me like remote work ruined my life. That's just not something that happens. It usually will make your life so much better. Yeah. I think that's a common, um, common thing I hear is that once you start working remote, it's just very unlikely that you're ever going to go back to working in an office. Yes, absolutely. That's something I'll avoid for the rest of my life. <laughs> Awesome, Andrea. Um, well, thank you so much for your time and sharing uh, not only your personal experiences, uh, but helping people put together a, a game plan for getting their very first remote job. Uh, I think this episode was very helpful and inspiring to a lot of people. So Andrea, um, could you just uh, share with people any message that you would like to share with the audience and where people can find you? Yes, absolutely. So thank you very much for having me here. I, again, help people land their first remote job. So if that's something that you're thinking of and you have no idea where to start, I have a bunch of free resources that you can get started with. I have free tips and a bunch of videos on my YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. And then if you want to jump a, like a step further, I have free video training that's in the link in, in the link in my bio in all my platforms. And then if you really are serious about it, then you can also join my course, Land Your First Remote Job. You can find me as It's a Travel OD on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and It's a Travel OD.com. Awesome. And we're going to link all that up in the show notes as well, all the different platforms. Um, again, my guest today was Andrea Valeria from It's a Travel OD.com. This has been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Thanks everyone for listening and thank you for joining us, Andrea. Thank you.